Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I have something special to talk about today. It's the Spectrum Analyzer that I built. Despite looking more like a piece of consumer AV gear, it really is a functional and useful radio frequency spectrum analyzer. I'll show you its features, demonstrate it working, walk through the block diagram, and provide my insight on the value and trade-offs for building such a complex instrument. So right away you notice something kind of unique about this spectrum analyzer. There's no display. And there's a reason for that. That's part of the elegance of the simplicity of the design. To see the output of the SA, you connect it to an oscilloscope that has been set to XY mode. Most of us electronic experimenters have an oscilloscope and you don't need a fancy model. Even my almost 50 year old rudimentary Tech 465 works great. It still has a sharp image. Its feature set is simple. Highlights of its capabilities include a frequency span of 50 kHz to 70 MHz, so that limits it to mostly the HF portion of the radio spectrum. At 0 dB input attenuation, it can safely handle signal power up to plus 10 dBm. Span is adjustable from about 50 kHz to 7 MHz. Minimum noise floor is about minus 95 dBm. By modern standards, that feature set is a bit quaint. Even a low-end modern SA works into the gigahertz spectrum and has better noise floor performance, among other additional capabilities. At this point, I'd like to give a brief history description of the background on the spectrum analyzer design. It's not my original creation. In fact, it's far from it. Um, this design actually is over 20 years old. It goes back to work that Wes Hayward, amateur call sign W7ZOI, and Terry White, K7TAU, published in a couple of articles in QST in August and September of 1998. Like all of Terry and Wes's work, those articles were extremely detailed. They provided detailed schematics of the circuitry and how it worked. A lot of theoretical descriptions from the block diagrams of how each stage worked. Essentially, it's a double conversion superheterodyne, very similar to most amateur radio receivers, and also parts lists. So you could go out and buy the parts and, and build this quite readily. For a number of years, a company called Kanga USA even manufactured printed circuit boards to make the construction easier, although I think they're now defunct. I can't find any reference to them on the internet anymore. In addition, there was a third article published in November of 1999 in QST that described in detail how to make a tracking generator for this project. And much like the preceding two articles, it went into great detail with schematics, theory of operation, and a parts list of how to build this. Now, the design continued to evolve over time. Both uh, Terry and Wes came up with improvements, and there was quite the user community that got involved building these and finding other refinements. And Wes, to this day, maintains on his website, w7zoi.net, a lot of those improvements that you can look at and see. Among others, there were improvements made to the intermediate filters. There were improvements made to the last IF amp and RF amp to make it more, uh, more accurate and use more modern components. And a lot of these details are also captured in this book published by ARRL, the Experimental Methods in RF Design. And the last comment I would make about the history, or the short history on this uh, spectrum analyzer design, is for many years there was a Yahoo groups for the uh, experimental methods in RF design, or EMF RFD, that spanned probably 15 years or so of user input. And unfortunately that's been um, uh, shut down since Yahoo stopped supporting groups, but there still is an archive of that information available online. And I read through that and there are a lot of good hints and tips that various constructors had um, collected over the years and I factored that into my uh, final decisions on how I built this. Okay, I've got my spectrum analyzer set up on my giant cake turntable. And what I thought I'd do for starters is just go from left to right to show what the various controls are on the front panel. So just over here on the left, this is just the power indicator. It's definitely not a display. That's just graphics I created to, to show what the function is. And then to the right of it, this is the input jack with a step attenuator that goes in four positions, 0, 10, 20, and 30 dBs of attenuation. Next, I grouped all of the time and span and sweep functions in the middle here. So there's a large knob that controls 
the actual tuning, and then two controls here, one for the span and one for the sweep rate. Down here, there's actually a variable IF gain in this design that you can adjust to set the reference level of the signal. And then two switches down here to be able to turn on a zero span mode. And then here's the resolution filters. As the design is fairly simple, there's only two resolutions, 30 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz. Next, I have the video filtering. And again, not much resolution there. It's either high, low, or none. And below that, there's actually adjustable control for what the uh, amplitude would be per division on the oscilloscope display, either uh, 10 dB for, per division or 2 dB per division. And then finally over on the right are the two additional features that the spectrum analyzer design has. There's the uh, calibrator that you can turn on that has a reference signal every 10 megahertz. And then here's the tracking generator. And there is a uh, fine-tune control that you can adjust to set the tracking frequency uh, a little more accurately. I'll spin the turntable around at this point so we can take a look at the back, and it is pretty simple. There's just two BNC connectors here, one for X-axis and Y-axis to connect to the oscilloscope. There's a potentiometer there that is adjusted during calibration to set the final gain of the amplifier. And then of course power and uh, power switch. The control layout is my own design and I decided to be really creative here. I made the graphics in PowerPoint and then printed them and then heat laminated them in 5 mil film. The knobs and the bezels you see I designed in 3D CAD and printed them using PLA resin and then I attached the bezels to the chassis using black oxide coated number 8 stainless steel screws. Another nice feature of this case that I bought is the paint on top is not just a dull flat finish it's actually like a splatter finish and I don't know how well it's going to turn up on video but trust me it does look pretty good. At this point you're probably thinking this spectrum analyzer case is the size of a VCR. And you're right, in fact the Spectrum Analyzer case is a little wider. They are of the same height and there's a story behind that. I bought this case online from an electronic surplus company. In fact it's not empty, it's actually a home network communications device called NABU. Apparently this was an attempt in Canada in the early 1980s for a home network technology that preceded the internet. It clearly was sized to fit alongside VCRs and stereos so that explains its form factor. But at any rate, it is a rock solid steel case that it's going to be great for RF projects and it comes stuffed with other salvageable goodies. Okay, here I've set the spectrum analyzer up to demonstrate it. I've connected the output from my HP signal generator to the spectrum analyzer input for a controlled reference signal. Right now I've got the generator set for 20 MHz, but there is no output, it's not turned on yet. I do have my trusty Tektronix 465 oscilloscope. I absolutely love this old analog scope. It's great for simple measurements and works very well with this SA. The way to configure it is to first set it in XY mode and then set the X axis to 1 volt per division, then set the Y axis to 0.5 volts per division, and then adjust the beam to the middle of the bottommost graticule before you turn the SA on. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn it on. And what we're seeing is essentially the noise floor, and I'll talk about that more at some point, but right now there's no signal coming into it from the signal generator. But if I do adjust the frequency, you can see there is a phenomenon here called the zero spur. That's this guy right here. That's just a artifact of how the heterodyne conversion works, and you can essentially ignore that for the purpose of making measurements. You can also see that there's some spurs, some noise coming in from the various uh, stages that I didn't get quite fully isolated from each other. Maybe also some external influence uh, from Stray RF. So it's not perfect. And that's actually one of my future tasks is to continue working on eliminating or at least reducing further some of those spurs. But at this point, I'll go ahead and turn the signal generator on. And I've got it set for minus 30, 30 dBm output. And there's, there's our signal there at 20 megahertz. I can adjust the span so we can take a closer look at that 20 megahertz signal and really zoom in on it as well as adjust the frequency. There we go. Now I do have my resolution filter set to 300 kilohertz so it's pretty wide. One of the things I'm not quite happy with is my 30 kilohertz filter has some issues. There's a combination of crystals in there and there's some ringing taking place and the filter's not quite fully balanced. As you can see, there's some um, multiple peaks going on in there, but that's future work. I'm much more interested in right now for using this in the wider 300 kilohertz filter and that's 
Not perfect either. There's definitely some asymmetry to the skirts. Again, more future work to try to refine, but it's working quite well for the purposes I'm going to put it towards. And I think what I'll do at this point, because getting any good video on this 465 uh, screen is kind of hard from a distance, I'm going to reset the camera and try to get the best shot I can of the screen and maximize the, the resolution for the next few shots. Okay, so I've reset the camera to try to get a higher resolution shot of the 465 screen. And a couple things I wanted to point out is, even though this is a fairly simple design, it does have fairly good accuracy as far as the signal strength, meaning the 10 dB per division on the scope. So I still have the 20 megahertz signal at minus 30 dBm coming into the SA. And what I'm going to do here is just in real time drop the signal by 10 dB, and as you can see, it tracks very nicely per division. I'll get all the way down to minus 90 dB, minus dBm, and I'm starting to just about lose the signal, and now it's gone into the noise. So somewhere between, say, minus 90, minus 95 dBm is the noise floor the way I have it configured. That's not stellar compared to, to modern apparatus, but it's good enough for the work I want to do here. So I'll raise the signal back up to 70, 60, 50, 40 minus 30 dBm, and uh, then there we go. Next is the selectable feature between 10 dB uh, per division and 2 dB per division. It's set right now to 10 dB, and I can switch it to 2, and there is a fine adjustment here, as well as a coarse adjustment, just to align it with the reference line of choice. And then if you watch, uh, it'll go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, as soon as I drop the signal generator by 10 dB, and there we go. It's off a little bit, not perfect, but certainly within less than a dB of accuracy. I mentioned earlier that the SA also has a calibrator function. So what I've done, I've reconnected the input to that calibrator, and I'll turn it on now. And it's very basic. It's just a crystal with overtones at 10 megahertz all the way out to the limit, about 70 megahertz and it's not a fixed amplitude obviously for each overtone but what I have done is just record using a separate meter what each of those peaks are. The final feature I want to show today is the tracking generator and what I've done is reconfigured the input cable to the output of the tracking generator and I'll go ahead and turn that on now and as you can see it's definitely not perfectly flat and one of the features that I would like to have in this SA is a way to normalize this but for the basic filters that I've been checking out at HF frequencies, this works just fine. Even though the functionality of the spectrum analyzer is pretty simple, it was a very fun project and very rewarding challenge to work on. Like I say on my channel, I'm looking for those intermediate to advanced EE projects to dive into, and this one was a good, uh, solid project to challenge me. As I'll go through in a moment, when I look at the block diagram, you'll see there's a lot of sections to um, construct. There are some tricks on how to get the various stages to work well with each other. And I had an opportunity to make some changes and adjustments of my own. Here's the block diagram. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the design uses two super heterodyne mixers. And to follow along, you can see the input in the upper left-hand corner and then the Y-axis output in the lower right-hand corner. So starting just off the input, there is a blocking capacitor to help keep most of the effects of DC out of the spectrum analyzer. Next, there's a step attenuator. That's the control on the front panel I can adjust to dial in how much attenuation I would like. And then a low pass filter that starts to roll off around 70 megahertz to keep higher frequency components from affecting the, the signal flow. Next we have the first mixer and its local oscillator comes from a 110 to 180 megahertz voltage controlled oscillator. That oscillator itself is controlled by the time base unit which also drives the tracking generator and provides the x-axis sweep signal. Then the output of the first mixer feeds into a 110.7 megahertz bandpass filter and then into the second mixer which uses a 100 megahertz fixed frequency local crystal oscillator. Next, the output of that second mixer is a 10.7 MHz signal that then goes into the selectable resolution filter, and then it feeds into the adjustable gain IF amplifier. That's the control on the front panel you can adjust depending upon the strength of your signal. After going through another bandpass filter, we reach the stage where the magic happens. That's the log amplifier. 
This is the analog devices part number AD8307 that outputs a volts per dB signal that is quite accurate. And then finally, we have the selectable amplifier for the vertical resolution, where you can switch between 2 dB per division or 10 dB per division. And then after that, we have the selectable video filter before we finally output the signal to the scope y-axis. I've skipped over some of the other amplifiers and filters, but that's okay. Most of this should be self-explanatory just by looking at the block diagram. I mentioned a couple of tricks and pitfalls. The majority of these stages must be highly isolated from stray RF noise, Otherwise, you will corrupt the signal path, and that will give you um, spurs on the display. So the method I used is a pretty common one. I put those particular stages in small die-cast aluminum project boxes. But then that creates another challenge. How do you get the signals between those boxes? The answer, of course, is you need solid RF interconnect coaxial cables, but that gets expensive in a hurry, especially once you tally up the number of SMA or equivalent type connectors you need. In a future video, I'll show more details on how I solved that particular problem more economically. I'd like to talk about some of the upsides and benefits for doing this project. First and foremost, I now have a spectrum analyzer, and when I started, I didn't, so that was a plus. Even if it is kind of limited in its functionality and what it can do, it is a solid and basic instrument that will help me do diagnostic work at RF frequencies and check out filters and transmitter circuits and whatnot. A second big advantage is I got to exercise my double E skills and expand enormously on my understanding of superheterodyne and how that works, how filters work and how you can construct them well or construct them poorly. So a lot of solid benefits from this project. A third big benefit is I love building things and this was a great example where I could merge my uh, skills with double E along with rapid manufacturing technologies like 3D printing and some graphic arts to make the, the, the front panel. So I got to be really creative on this and come up with some really fun ideas of how to make this look well as well as function well. And finally, like any good engineer, I found ways I'd like to improve it going forward. So I have a, a short list of ideas that I'd like to do in a second version someday. And of course, on that list is some way to incorporate microcontrollers into a very simple display and get some digital output. And to be fair, I have to talk about some of the disadvantages and challenges of this project. And one of the big ones is the cost. So. Altogether, the parts and shipping on this project came in at just under $400, so that's not an insignificant amount of money. If you break down the, the parts as to which were the most expensive, I'm showing them over here to the side, and things like the individual die-cast aluminum boxes, those add up in a hurry, as well as some of the specialized ICs from analog devices, and a couple of the parts are becoming um, a little hard to find, like the voltage-controlled oscillator and some of the MMIC parts. So if you compare that to what else you could spend that money on, one of the biggest arguments is you could buy a tiny SA or a nano VNA. In fact, you could buy both of them probably more than once before you hit $400. So for sure, I could have had brand new instruments that would have had higher functionality. That does come with a bit of a caveat, bit of a risk. I know there are quite a few counterfeits of those instruments out of the market, so you do have to be careful to find those and find a good one. Another obvious choice would have been just to uh, buy a, a used spectrum analyzer on eBay or from a, a ham fest. Maybe you have to pay a little more than $400, but you could probably get one that would suffice. And even that's got a few risks of itself. You don't really know what you've got until you fire it up. And a spectrum analyzer is one of the most easily damaged and most expensive items to repair in the test lab. All you have to do is overload that input beyond what it's rated to for the amount of uh, RF power, and you could fry some expensive parts in there. The other thing is a lot of the spectrum analyzers you can find on eBay these days are from the 1980s, and many of those relied on battery backed up uh, memory for factory calibrations. And there are some challenges to make sure that that doesn't get lost. And if it does, you could be in a world of hurt trying to get the instrument recalibrated and useful again. So that's a wrap for today's video. In future episodes, I'll be getting into the internal construction of the Spectrum Analyzer and show you some of the other challenges I had to overcome. So as always, if you like what you see, click the like button and be sure to subscribe to get automatic future updates. Bye for now.